on Yer Aleph Nisan, on the 11th of Nisan in Tafre Shamach Beis, in 1902, the Rebbe's holy neshama came into this world 118 years ago. Tzadikim b'misosan kruin chayim. The truly righteous, even in their passing, are called living. And as we know with regard to Meish Rabbeinu, that the birth date of a tzaddik is not only meaningful during his terrestrial lifetime, but it continues to be meaningful and to resonate with power in the years, decades, centuries that follow. The best example of this is actually with Meish Rabbeinu. The Gemara tells us that when Haman drew lots because he wanted to destroy the Jewish people, when his lottery fell on the month of Adar, it says, Samach Simcha G'dayla, that he had a tremendous amount of joy. And the Gemara explains that he said that this is the day, this is the month, in which Moshe Rabbeinu was nostalgic, in which Moshe Rabbeinu was taken from the Jewish people. And as such, this is a month that has, it portends for bad things for the Jewish people. It portends for, the, for loss for the Jewish people. And therefore it would be a, a good month, a good time, for him to carry out his nefarious machinations. The Gemara says that the Malachim laughed at him. And they said that although it's true that Moshe Rabbeinu passed on the seventh day of Adar, it's also true that Moshe Rabbeinu was born on the seventh day of Adar. And the Gemara says something very strange. The Gemara says, Kedai haleida shetachapet al hamisa. That birth is powerful enough to override or to remove the effects of death. On the surface, a very strange statement. It's a strange statement because the facts tell a different story. A person is born, so they're part of this world, they're living here in a terrestrial sense. And then when a person passes away, so death ends what birth begins. Birth begins the entrance of a person into this world and the terrestrial lifetime comes to an end and they leave this world on the day of their passing. And because of that, it would be reasonable to say that Hamisa, that passing is Mechaper al Haleda. The word Mechaper can be understood as a tone for, it could also be understood as a euphemism for to wipe away or to do away with the effects. So, but clearly the Gemara doesn't see it that way. Clearly our sages saw it as Kedai Haleda Shatachaper al Hamisa. That birth is able to override and to neutralize the impact of death, of passing. So how do we understand this? I mean, like uh, on a very literal level, it's very, very difficult to wrap one's head around. And the Rebbe once explained this is because that although the death of a tzaddik is a very trying and, and difficult event, and today actually the tenth day of Adar of, of Nisan, pardon me, represented the first histalkus of the first major tzaddik for the Jewish people in history. Today was the yard site, the passing of Miriam Hanavia. And that had the tremendous fallout for the Jewish people. And for many, many centuries, it was customary to fast on the 10th day of Nisan, unless it fell on Shabbos like this year. So, so the concept of passing of a tzaddik has with it a, a tremendous negative and, and, and sad undertone. But at the same time, the passing of a tzaddik, which records the terrestrial exit of the tzaddik from this world, the passing of the tzaddik, nonetheless, is not nearly powerful enough to override the birth of the tzaddik. Because when real tzaddikim come into this world, they don't leave. They continue to remain with us, as the Gemara says, that Yaakov, Avinu, our father Jacob, is not called, we don't use the word death. And even though there's a funeral that's described in great detail, the passing of Yaakov is described as a, a shift, a change, but Misa Nemra, the term death is not used. And the Gemara tells us that Mazare Bechayim Afu Bechayim, that as he continues to, to live on in this world through his children, as his children are alive, he is alive. Which means to say that the spirit of the Neshama of the Tzaddik continues to live on a very literal level, 
as long as his children, his disciples, those who carry on his mission and his, his message continue to live, so he lives through them. The neshama remains here in this world and the terrestrial expression of the neshama is found through zarei, is found through the children, through the disciples, through those who were inspired by him. I'm saying this all as a bit of a, a preamble to the words that I want to share. So Yud Aleph Nisan, today is Yud Aleph Nisan. And today is the day that God decided that this very holy neshama, this very special neshama, the Nasi of Ardar, should come into this world. And the Rebbe's neshama continues to remain with us. Terrestrially, the Rebbe's holy goof was laid to rest. And of course we go to the oil to Davin. But the neshama continues to remain here with us in this world. As his legacy lives on, as his disciples live on, as, has, as his chasidim live on, it's evident that the Rebbe continues to exert an enormous amount of positivity and has a, a tremendous impact on those of us who are here in this world. The truth is, as I, I sent out a small little missive, small little uh, few words that I was able to type up before Shabbos, the truth is that we always remain connected to the neshamas of our parents and our grandparents, and tzaddikim are called, are called a parent, like Eliyahu Hanavi, when he takes leave of Elisha, Elisha cries out, Avi, Avi, my father, my father. And, and nowhere does the Torah describe the relationship between Sadiqim and between their disciples as in the term of a Rebbe, but rather in the term of a parent. So we always remain connected to Neshamas in the other world. And the Neshamas in the other world are very real. And life in the other world is very real. It's called Chaya Chayim, the life, the afterlife is a very real thing. And it's not mutually exclusive from us. It's something that we're very much connected to. Very much connected to. But in, 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 this, in, in view of all this, and despite all of this, the neshama of the great tzaddikim of the ages remain with us in a very, very literal way. And so I wanted to share a little story, a, little, a, little, a few words about the Rebbe. And there are many miracle stories. Many, many miracle stories. More miracle stories than we can actually even collect anymore. But to me, the, the, the stories which are most meaningful are the stories that give us a glimpse into who the Rebbe was, into who the Rebbe is, into, into, into his very, very unique personality and the way he lived his life. So this is a story that I, I, that I, I, I shared before. But it's a, a story that I think has a tremendous amount of insight, as I said, into, into who the Rebbe was, how he saw himself. There was a very well-known chassid, his name was Rabbi Yosef Weinberg. And he was a man who traveled around the world. He used to collect funds for the Lubavitch Yeshiva. And he also had the privilege of speaking on the radio on a weekly basis. In fact, he taught the entirety of Tanya on the radio over a course of well over a decade. And the Rebbe would edit his transcripts, his radio transcripts. That's how we have the, the book, Shiurim B'Sefer Tanya. The, the, there's a, a, a formal... I would say, what, what you would call a translation, which is an official translation of Tanya, because we know that Rebbe reviewed it, and it was taken from the radio transcripts, Lessons in Tanya. And the Rebbe would actually listen to the radio. The Rebbe would listen as, as Rabbi Weinberg would, would, would speak. So the story goes that Rabbi Weinberg gets a call one night from somebody in a distant place who desperately wanted a bracha from the Rebbe for... I believe it was their child who was ill. And he raced to 770, and he saw that the Rebbe was still in his office very, very late at night. But the Rebbe's secretaries had already left. And not knowing, this is in the very early years, I think before 1960, not knowing what to do, so he decided that he would place the note in the in the door. We were able to come really right up to the Rebbe's door those days. He would place the note in the door. And this way, when the Rebbe would leave his office, the Rebbe would see the note that he had written. And the Rebbe would pray for this person or give this person a bracha. So, and then he stayed from afar to watch to see what would happen. When the Rebbe opened the door, so the note fell, fell out. He had placed it in a crack. The note fell on the floor. And he saw the Rebbe bent down to pick up the note and that the Rebbe had read the note. 
So on one hand, he was very happy. He was able to call this person in a faraway place and tell them that he had managed to get a note through to the Rebbe and surely the Rebbe would, would pray and, and there would be a bracha and hopefully there will be good news. But on the other hand, he felt very bad that he had caused the Rebbe to bend down. Chassid doesn't want to add any burden to the Rebbe. So he wrote a little note to the Rebbe afterwards apologizing for having taken the freedom of placing the note after hours, as they say. And he, he apologized. He asked the Rebbe to forgive him for causing him to bend down. So the Rebbe responded to Rabbi Weinberg's note and he said that there's no reason for an apology. And the Rebbe wrote some in- incredible words, which I think all of us must take to heart. The Rebbe wrote, Haloi ze kol inyoni. This is what I'm all about. This defines my essence. So you're asking, you're asking me to forgive you for me having bent down to help somebody else. The Rebbe said, Halei ze kol inyoni. This is my essence. To bend down and to pick up something in order to pick up, to help another Yid, to, to, to lower himself, to bend down, to lift somebody up. And the Rebbe added the words, Ubefrat was andere farzen or the fargesen. Especially those, the things that other people didn't notice or forgot about. And this is how the Rebbe really led his life, always being concerned for others, always trying to uplift others, and especially people or things that had become forgotten, that had fallen by the wayside. And, and, and the Rebbe, when the Rebbe said that, the, that it, well, there was no apology necessary, it wasn't, it wasn't just words. The Rebbe, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe didn't play with words. He meant it in a very serious way. This is how the Rebbe saw himself. There was no reason to apologize that he bent down because his whole essence was about bending down to help and to assist and to provide some kind of comfort or solace for another. So I want to share a story within a story as sometimes I do. This is, this is more of a, a little bit of a personal story and I, I shared it two years ago, but it was something I was thinking a lot, a lot about today. I was thinking about it because we're dealing with illness. Um... You know, recovery, so not a, not a simple process. It, uh, person, illness drains one of strength. And, and recovery is a, it's a process. It's a process and it take, takes its time. You can't accelerate that process of recovery, <clears throat> as I found that the hard way. And, and the world is very concerned. The focus is, uh, is, uh, is on contagion and infection, but also very much people are, are talking about illness and hopefully recovery for those who are ill. So... It's not a secret that the Rebbe had a heart attack in 1977, a massive heart attack, a heart attack from which very few people survive. It's also not a secret that all of the doctors, all of the doctors who were present, and there was a doctor who lived in Toronto named Max Glassman who passed away a few years ago. Uh, All the doctors believe that the Rebbe must go to the hospital immediately after suffering such a massive heart attack. And they predicted that there would be another heart attack, and there was another heart attack. In the wee hours of the morning of Shemini Atzeres, there was a devastating heart attack, which robbed the Rebbe of, of uh, any pulmonary activity and any cardiac activity for over seven minutes. The, f- the fact that he was able to recover and live a normal life is not, nothing short of miraculous. That's, that's in medical terms. At any rate, uh, Max Glassman, Dr. Glassman, was in the Rebbe's office, and he said to the Rebbe that the Rebbe must go to the hospital, otherwise he literally will be responsible for his life. And the Rebbe said to him, I'm not going to the hospital. And he said to the Rebbe, you have to listen to doctors. I'm telling you that you're not going to make it. You're not going to survive. And the Rebbe pointed at his table, at the desk where the Rebbe studied Torah and responded to tens of thousands of letters over the course of the Rebbe's terrestrial lifetime and leadership. The desk that the Rebbe had received thousands and thousands of visitors. The desk where the Rebbe had davened after hours. The Rebbe pointed at his desk and he said, the Rebbe said, this is my Kodesh HaKadoshim. This is my Holy of Holies, the Rebbe said. And the Rebbe pointing at his desk said, from this desk, Thousands and thousands of people 
have had a Yeshua, have found salvation. And he said, my Yeshua will come from here as well. My Yeshua will come from, from this spot. And in the end, the Rebbe did not go to the hospital. And the Rebbe remained in his, in his, in his, in his office, which was turned into a mini hospital, you know, the technology of the day. And it's very, very um, compelling to note that when the Rebbe had the stroke, on the 27th day of Adar, at the Oihel, the first ambulance to come was the local Hatzalah, the local Queen's Hatzalah. And of course, they put the Rebbe in the ambulance and they wanted to take the Rebbe to the hospital. And the car wouldn't start. The ambulance wouldn't start. They tried multiple times where they couldn't get the ambulance to start. Finally, the Hatzalah ambulance from Crown Heights arrived and they transferred the Rebbe from the Queen's Hatzalah ambulance into the the uh, ambulance of Crown Heights and they asked the Rebbe, should they take him to his room? And the Rebbe nodded with his head and the, the van began and they left. And I heard this from somebody who was there. He said, literally, the moment that the van of the Hatzalah, the Hatzalah ambulance left, the Hatzalah Queen's ambulance suddenly turned on and as if nothing had ever happened and they left. Clearly, that's where the Rebbe wanted to be. So why am I sharing uh, that story? Uh, this is... The story brings me to a, a very, very personal story that I shared also a few years ago, but, you know, people are forgetful. And I, and I think, nonetheless, this contributes and this adds to the thrust of, of the point that I'm trying to make tonight. And, and, and I'm, I'm actually going somewhere. <laughs> when, the Rebbe, when the Rebbe had a heart attack in 1977, so my father told me that he came home from Shul in the afternoon, maybe... Uh, at two or three o'clock in the afternoon on Shemini Atzeres. They hadn't eaten anything. And there would have been Minyan and Fertilim the whole morning. There was a Minyan that walked to the oil. And my grandfather was very, very concerned. My grandfather, Allah Vashon, said to my father, what's, 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 what's by the Rebbe? And my father said, it's a, uh, nobody, nobody knows with full certainty. The word, word has not come out fully, but it's, 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 not, it's not a good situation. It's, very, it's, a, it's not a good situation. So Maizeda said, um, go, to, go to the secretaries and tell them that my cousin Bernie is the biggest cardiologist in America. So my, my Zayda had a whole family, cousins, first cousins, second cousins, who had left Europe in the, in the late 1920s, left Lithuania in the late 1920s, the early 30s, and they had survived the war. But um, their Yiddishkeit had not survived intact. And when he came to the United States in the 50s, my, my grandfather met up with these cousins that he had known as, in his childhood. So one of his cousins, one of his first cousins, was a woman named Bela Hinda, who I think was about 10 or 15 years older than my Zayde. Maybe 20 years older than him. So he's, he's, my father said, Bela Hinda Zun, Bela Hinda's son, Bernie, is a grace a doctor. So, you know, my father says, like, Dad, like, give me a break. You know, okay, okay. your cousin's son is a grace of doctor. Like, everybody's a grace of doctor. You know, everybody's a big doctor. Like, your, your, fa your cousin's son. No, 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 my Zayda says, you don't understand. Bela Hinde told me he's one of the biggest cardiologists in the world today. My father's like, okay, do, me, do me a favor. Like, right, your, your cousin's son is the biggest cardiologist. It says connecting. I don't know what that means. Huh? But what happens to all the people who are on Zoom? I'm sorry, everybody on Facebook. I was <laughs> communicating with people on Zoom as well. But usually it extends it. No, oh, no, oh, here's everybody back. Everybody's no, back. We lost you at the, the middle of, um, when the Zayda was going. How big a cardiologist is, you'll find that now where he is. So my Zayda goes home, and it's already Shmini Atzeres, late in the afternoon or towards evening, and he calls his cousin Bela Hinda. Bela Hinda is not observant, and she answers the phone, and she hears my Zayda's voice, and she says, uh, Mesha, bist du mashugi geworden? You're calling me on Shmini Atzeres? And, and he says, no, 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 Bela Hinde, you don't understand. The Rebbe had a heart attack. 
She said, oh, the Rebbe had a heart attack. Oy, oy, the Lubavitch Rebbe had a heart attack. So Bela Hinda says, uh, you're looking for Bernie, huh? So he says, yeah, I'm looking for Bernie. So my, my, uh, his cousin says to my Zayda, ich, ich ich I don't know where he is. His first cousin, Chaim Grosbart, who's a professor of psychology at Columbia University, they're very close. They're very close. So if you call cousin Chaim, cousin Chaim might know where Bernie is. So my Zayda called cousin, cousin Chaim, and cousin Chaim wasn't observant either, and he was also shocked to hear my grandfather on the phone, Shemina Tzeres, and he explained to him the situation, and there's a life at stake, and the Lubavitcher had a heart attack. So he said, he said, you must, you must, um, you must call Russia. At that time, Brezhnev was the, the, the leader of the Communist Party, of the Politburo, but uh, those who know, the brains behind the Communist Party, the brains behind the USSR, was a man whose name was Suslov. Suslov was actually the president of the Communist Party, and he was the brains behind the USSR. And they, Suslov suffered from, from a heart condition, and they had brought Bernie Laun from the United States, who grew up in Lithuania and spoke Russian, they brought him to Moscow to treat S S President Suslov. Now you can understand that uh, if they're bringing an American cardiologist, you can understand that uh, we're dealing here with somebody of a very high caliber. Anyway, my grandfather begins to make phone calls and he calls the hotel and he can't find him. Finally, he locates him in the middle of the night. It's about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning in Moscow. And, and the, the Dr. Laun Yatter in the, in the ballet theater of Moscow, the big ballet theater of Moscow. And my grandfather, of course, spoke Russian, grew up in Russia. So he managed to tell people at the front desk this was a massive emergency and they had to find uh, Dr. Laun. And they did find Dr. Laun. And when Dr. Laun heard what happened, he, he immediately, in the middle of the night, called up Suslov's office and he said that he has an emergency, he has to return to the United States. He will see Suslov at nine o'clock in the morning for a final examination. He'll write up a report after and he must leave immediately as a family emergency. And he, after meeting Suslov, he went straight to the airport and he took the first plane he was able to get onto and he came to the United States. By this time, it was already um, the morning after Simchas Teda, and my father picked his cousin, his second cousin up from the airport. And, and he brought him to, to the Rebbe. First, he was by, by the Rebbe for several hours examining the Rebbe. And then afterwards, he spent uh, maybe up to two hours with the Rebbetson. And then my father took him to his parents' home to, to, to have something to eat. And when he got into the car, he was gushing about the Rebbetson. He couldn't, he couldn't stop talking. He was so impressed. With, uh, with the queenly demeanor, the, the, the princely demeanor of the Rebetzin. But afterwards, he began to say to my father, he said, the man is a genius. He's an absolute genius. And he kept saying this. And, and my father kind of queried, what did he mean? And he said, said something amazing. He said that the Rebbe, by being in his room in 770, and at that time, they didn't want to know, if, should they dance our kafas, shouldn't they dance our kafas? The Rebbe said that if he'll hear the singing, it will make him better. He said, by being in his room and by knowing that he was able to actively contribute to the festivities in, in, the base, in the shul downstairs, he said, this is how he saved his own life. Because he had a sense of, of, of mission. He had a sense of value. He had a sense that he was contributing in a very serious way to the Hasidim. This enabled him psychologically and, and, and psychoschematically enabled him to be able to overcome the, the unbelievable challenges, the cardiac challenges that his body had endured. And there's much to be said about this, but uh, I, I, I think the story is, is self-evident in and of itself. It, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it tells us so much on so many levels. But what I want to su suggest to all of you is that the Rebbe lived entirely, his whole existence, literally to the point of saving his own life, is all about giving for others, doing for others. And we find ourselves now in the last days before Pesach. Today is the Rebbe's Yom Oledes. I, I'm pretty sure that Rabbi Yassi has many, many packages of Shmur Matzah that we have not yet distributed. You know, this is not exactly, we didn't know how things are going to look the days before Pesach. So if you know of a Jew who doesn't yet have Shmur Matzah for Pesach, I think the practical takeaway of this little Fabrengen, we'll have a Fabrengen tomorrow, special for Yerav Nisim. I've been sharing words in Matzah Shabbos last few weeks already. And we'll have a message tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll do a little for bringing for Yadav Nissen. But I, I want to ask all of you to think long and hard about your repertoire of family and friends 
and maybe there's somebody who doesn't yet have Shemur Matzah. And uh, you'll be in touch, send Rabbi Yassi an email or a text or a WhatsApp message of how to get a package of matzah. And of course, we should be very careful with social distancing and we, should, we shouldn't be near anybody. Uh, it means literally picking up the matzah you know, from a table out in the parking lot and it means leaving it at somebody's door. Not chas v'shalom doing anything, which, which is dangerous in any way, shape or form. We have to listen to the doctors and we have to stay healthy and we have to stop the, the chas v'shalom, God forbid, the furtherance of infection, but to try to get this, I know, I think this will bring the Rebbe tremendous joy on high, and it would, it would uh, be very, very meaningful if we would celebrate the Rebbe's birthday that way, by sharing matzah with the Yidu doesn't have, especially there'll be so many Jews who are alone, at the very least, they should have the actual shmur matzah, the, the matzah, the way it has always been since the time of antiquity, and hopefully, through our efforts, we will accelerate the process of the coming of Mashiach. On Matzah Shabbos on Saturday night, we take new hope, even in darkest, the darkest of times. We say, Hine Kel Yeshuasi, that God is the God of our salvation, and that Hashem provides us with everything that we need, and He will, in Merza Hashem, bring us the light and the salvation that we all require during these difficult times, hopefully culminating with the coming of Mashiach, Bemheira, will be a main or a main Shavua Tov. A good